Sai Ram Starting today we in the Prashanti Digital Studios feel privileged and blessed to present an unusual radio series based on the Bhagavad Gita the eternal message of the Lord to man There have been many talks books commentaries and even films and tv programs on the geeta radio site itself has broadcast programs based on the geeta you may therefore wonder what is special about the series we are now getting ready to offer what is new are three features firstly we offer the geeta in the form of a simple dialogue that is easy to understand rather than in the form of poetry or shlokas as is usually the case secondly we bring to your attention the hidden details and the meanings of the geeta via the teachings of our beloved bhagwan and thirdly we try and relate the teachings of the geeta to today's world and today's problems it is in these respects that our presentation is different from the other versions of the geeta that have been presented earlier both by us and by others elsewhere as you might be aware for over 60 years or more bhagwan baba has been living the teachings of the geeta every single minute this should not come as a surprise when god comes down in human form he always lives his message that was true of lord rama every second of rama's life was an affirmation of satya and dharma it was also true of the krishna avatar but the unique aspect of the krishna avatar is that for the first time god spoke directly to man giving man the eternal message of the lord that message is what is contained in the bhagavad gita bhagwan baba says that contrary to what many people think god did not incarnate as sri krishna merely to eliminate a few demons like kamsa for example the main purpose of the incarnation was to teach man the purpose of life and the way life must really be lived the gita is thus a manual for life many read the gita at the time of funerals the feelings that motivate such practices is understandable at the same time it is essential to understand that the gita must be read and its teachings practiced while one is alive after death of what use is the geeta right from the time when he left school to dedicate himself to the service of humanity bhagwan baba has not only been living life as man really should but he has also been teaching man the basic lessons of life while krishna taught the lesson only once swami has been imparting the teaching again and again man today is so busy that he has very little time for god man may forget god but god is very compassionate that is why swami is repeating the message again and again so that somewhere during his busy schedules man would catch a few words of divine wisdom and change the course of his life to move towards god yes the gita is the road map that would slowly but most certainly take us all to god you may ask why should one go to god if i spend my life on issues related to life after death then what happens to my time here on earth does it mean i should not study get a degree get a job have a family try to be successful in life build a house etc somehow people seem to think 
that God does not want man to do all these things. God does not ever say all that. All he says is, O man, live in this world and fully, but be sure you live the correct way. That's all. Let's now go back to Krishna and trace the events leading to the Kurukshetra war, at the beginning of which Krishna finally decided to give man the eternal teaching. The Lord has incarnated many times and about 5000 years ago He incarnated in human form as Bhagwan Sri Krishna. Humans are born as a result of past karma. The Lord's birth in human form is not a karma janma. It is always a leela janma or a divine sport. In the case of Krishna, there was no shortage of leelas during the early period. However, Krishna did not come just to perform leelas or even to slay a few evil persons like Kamsa for example. He came mainly to give mankind a precious message. That he did in Kurukshetra just before the epic battle between the Pandavas and Kauravas commenced. The Gita was not taught to Arjuna on the mere spur of the moment. In fact, Lord Krishna had set it all up over many, many years. First, he became a friend and relative of Arjuna. Krishna then engineered a split between the Kauravas and the Pandavas, which started with the Pandavas losing their kingdom in a game of dice. As per the agreement, the Pandavas after losing all their possessions, retired to the forest and spent many years there. After that, they spent one year incognito. In all, the banishment was for a period of 14 years. At the end of the stipulated exile period, the Pandavas were supposed to get their kingdom back, but they did not. Tension built up and it looked like war. Krishna then went to the court of the Kauravas to bring about peace and understanding between the two parties, but his mission did not succeed. Is there such a thing as failure in God's dictionary? Obviously not. If Krishna's mission of peace did not succeed, it was because Krishna himself had willed that it shall be so. After the collapse of Krishna's peace mission, War between the Pandavas and the Kauravas became inevitable. Both parties sought Krishna's help. Krishna offered them a choice, his armies or himself, with the condition that if chosen, he would not fight but only lend support. As we all know, the Kauravas chose Krishna's armies while the Pandavas preferred Krishna, knowing fully well that he would not participate in the battle. The day chosen for the battle dawned and the two armies assembled in full formation taking positions against each other. Krishna was driving Arjuna's chariot. All the leading warriors blew their conscience. Arjuna also did and so did Krishna. At that point Arjuna asked Krishna to drive his chariot to the middle of the battleground so that he could see both the armies arrayed against each other. Krishna does that. Arjuna then slowly lets his eyes wander, drinking in the scene. Everywhere he sees people whom he knows well, many of them his friends and many of them his relatives. The army against which he would wage war includes his grandfather Bhishma, his gurus Dronacharya and Kripacharya, his cousins the Kauravas and so on. Arjuna is beginning to be seized with doubts. He wonders, do I really have to fight to these people and actually try to kill them? The moment had at last arrived and it is at that point 
that the teaching of the eternal lesson starts. More about all that later. But for the moment, we leave you with the remarks Gandhi ji has made about the Gita. Gandhi said, and I quote, Man is not at peace with himself till he has become like unto God. The endeavor to reach this state is the supreme and the only ambition worth having. And this is self-realization. This self-realization is the subject of the Gita as it is of all scriptures. The Gita has become for us a spiritual reference book. End of quote. Mahatma Gandhi's comment not only calls attention to the importance of the Gita but also points out that it is the best road to universal peace. Jai Sai Ram. Sai Ram. We now begin the presentation of the Gita in the form of a simple conversation between God and man on the battlefield in Kurukshetra before the war between the Kauravas and the Pandavas got underway. It all begins with Arjuna asking Krishna, his charioteer, to take the chariot to the middle of the battlefield so that he, Arjuna, could survey both armies. Krishna does that. Arjuna sees the scene and absorbs it. He is now beginning to be seized with doubts. Was it worth killing all these people for the sake of a mere kingdom? Was it not a great sin to do so? And so on. Doubts go through his mind. Arjuna is filled with anguish. And let us listen now and catch what Arjuna says to Krishna and what reply the Lord gives. Krishna, how can I fight this war? Bhishma over there is my grandfather. How can I shoot arrows at my own grandfather who has showered so much love on me? And over there is my guru Dronacharya. How can one kill one's own guru? Can there be a greater sin? As the Sutradari of this divine play, Krishna knows fully well that Arjuna would speak like this. In fact, he had set it all up so that Arjuna would have precisely such doubts. But like avatars always do, Krishna acts very much human and says, Arjuna, how come you have suddenly become so remorseful at this very last minute? You can't quit now. It is too late for that. You have got to cast aside your doubts and misgivings. Get up and enter into battle. Frankly, Krishna, I cannot see any great purpose in this war. I am very confused at present. To fight or not to fight? That is my question. Arjuna was caught in what is called a Dharma Sankatam. For a long time, he and his brothers had felt that the Kauravas had tricked, deceived and cheated them. The Kauravas had also humiliated them, besides subjecting them to much difficulties. They, the Pandavas, had endured all this with patience. They offered peace and the offer was carried by none other than Krishna himself. But the Kauravas had contemptuously rejected it. Finally, there was no course left except war. Then there was the pledge taken by Draupadi at the moment of her extreme humiliation. As her husband, Arjuna had sworn to redeem that pledge. War it was to be. And yet when the moment had arrived, Arjuna was beginning to have second thoughts. In life, one is often placed in a situation where there are two difficult options to choose from. Both seem the right course to follow, 
and both look like two different dharmic options which one to choose that is the dilemma arjuna was facing right there in the battlefield minutes before the war was to start not knowing what exactly he should do arjuna then spoke the crucial words he said o krishna i seek refuge in you totally surrendering to you i pray to you for guidance unknown to him while giving expression to his misgivings arjuna had uttered the all important word surrender when one surrenders fully to the lord he always responds that is what krishna did he gave divine advice to arjuna pulling him out of doubt and despondency the advice that krishna gave to arjuna on the battlefield in kurukshetra 5000 years ago was no ordinary advice nor was it the advice given by the lord to one man in one particular situation it is the lord's advice to all humans valid in all situations and for all times that is what makes the bhagavad gita so very important responding to arjuna krishna replies with a broad smile krishna was always smiling that was his nature krishna says arjuna you are acting like a perfect fool you are mourning the death of your relatives and friends even before they have died do you know anything about life death and what happens after death you obviously do not for if you did you would not be chickening out like you are trying to do now let me drive some hard facts into your thick skull arjuna your big problem is that like everyone else you think you are the body you are so used to seeing bodies being born and die since all these images have got stuck in your mind you are now worrying about death krishna pinpoints the source of arjuna's problems it was the mind in a sense most of the problems of mankind whether it is personal problems family problems or even national or international problems all originate in the mind of humans the mind is extremely powerful and used the wrong way it can cause havoc via the gita krishna explains to arjuna and indeed to all mankind how the mind holds the key to both misery and happiness today there are so many problems in the world like corruption conflict terrorism pollution global warming stress obesity child diabetes the list is endless believe it or not the mind is responsible for all these problems and if you know how to handle the mind carefully and properly indeed most of the problems can be solved now and always it is in that sense that the gita is both timeless and very powerful let us now join krishna and arjuna and see how their conversation is proceeding krishna says arjuna listen to this carefully neither you nor i are the body though we both possess them i wear my body like a dress and so do you now who is this i that is wearing the body arjuna it is the immortal and the universal soul or the atma that is wearing the body by the way there is no such thing as my atma your atma and so on it is the same atma that is present everywhere wearing many dresses there is only one atma period krishna i am totally lost here i am asking you about killing my kith and kin and you are telling me that there is only one atma which is present in all the bodies this is just too much for me please what is this atma you are talking about arjuna has every reason to feel lost while he was talking about the war krishna had suddenly changed the topic from war and death to something far away namely the atma 
There is Arjuna, quite unhappy about having to fight his grandfather and gurus. And here is Krishna talking spirituality about the Atma and all that. You might wonder about the sudden change of gear. One can legitimately ask, what's really going on? What has the Atma got to do with war? What has it got to do with fighting one's own grandfather who has showered so much love earlier? Will God ever do anything without reason? Obviously not. In life, we often make a division by saying, this is spiritual and that is not. Krishna wants Arjuna and indeed all of us to understand that such separation is entirely artificial. God wants all actions to be spiritual. And through the Gita, Krishna explains how all actions can indeed be made spiritual. Let us catch up again with Krishna and Arjuna and see how the Lord handles Arjuna's question. Arjuna, I can understand your difficulty and maybe an example would make things a bit clearer. Just look up in the sky during the daytime. You will see some clouds here and there, an empty sky in between. Everywhere, including in the spaces between clouds, there is water vapor. In some places, this water vapor shows itself up as clouds. Elsewhere, it is not visible, but it is present all the same. Notice a few interesting points. Firstly, the clouds appear and disappear. They are transient and not permanent. Next, while they exist, they keep changing their shapes. And thirdly, no two clouds are alike. The same sort of thing happens in the world. The Atma pervades the entire world, indeed the entire universe. Here and there it manifests temporarily via the dresses called bodies, not only of humans but also of animals, insects, etc. Thus. All living beings are embodiments of the one universal Atma. Recall what I told you about clouds changing their shapes with time? The same sort of thing happens to a living being or the embodied Atma. The being passes through various stages such as childhood, youth, middle age and old age. When the body becomes old, the Atma just casts off the body and wears a new dress. That is, it acquires another new body. Arjuna, I am telling you all this because you started feeling sad about death. There is no need to feel sad because death is just a change of dress. That is all. Your problem is that like all humans, you are totally focused on the body. You think you are the body. Tell me Arjuna, is the dress you are wearing Arjuna? No, it is just your dress. You are not the dress, but different from the dress. In the same way, neither you, nor I, or for that matter, anyone else is the body. The Atma is our real nature. Death makes people sad because they foolishly identify themselves with the body and become upset when it is gone or about to go. This is a profound lesson and it is related to the question of our real identity. Sage Ramana Maharishi often posed the question, Who are you? Bhagavan Baba also often tells us, Ask yourselves, Who am I? This is an important question in Vedanta and Krishna is slowly revealing the answer to Arjuna. Now why should Arjuna know this? His problem was to fight or not to fight. What has the answer to the philosophical question, who am I, have got to do with what? Everything, in fact, as Krishna will explain later, everything we do or do not do in life is related to this question. All that would come later. Jai Sai Ram.
Sai Ram. In the last episode, we saw Krishna telling Arjuna that he was making a big mistake in trying to withdraw from the war at the very last moment. Krishna explains that Arjuna's change of attitude arose from a basic confusion about who exactly he was, that is to say Arjuna. To us, this might sound surprising. Arjuna not knowing who he was? How could that be? Had he suddenly forgotten that he was a Pandava, the younger brother of Dharmaraja and so on? What is the meaning of Arjuna not knowing who he was? Forget Arjuna. Do we really know who we are? Do you think that question is surprising? Have we not heard Bhagwan Baba raise this question many times in his discourses? Does he not ask the question, Who am I? The question, Who am I? is very basic to Vedanta and it arises for the following reason. As Baba explains, each of us is a mixture of three entities. They are firstly the gross body, next the subtle mind and finally the Atma. Normally we identify ourselves with the body-mind combination. Baba says that while this might be meaningful from a worldly point of view, this is not correct from a spiritual point of view. From a spiritual point of view, the answer to the question, who am I, is I am I, where the I represents the Atma. Now we may think this identification is strange. That is what Arjuna also thought when Krishna told him that he was really the Atma. Let us listen and see how Krishna clarifies Arjuna's doubts. Arjuna, just think, you are a warrior and you have fought battles before. Sometimes you have even slain people in those battles, yet were never bothered then. But today, you are feeling miserable even before you have taken the bow in your hand. Why Arjuna? Why? Let me tell you. Arjuna, you are feeling miserable because the people likely to die in this war are yours. It is this feeling of mine that is really troubling you and not death per se. Arjuna, this feeling of mine comes because of body consciousness or body attachment. You think you are the perishable body, but that is not true. I remind you once again, you are the eternal Atma. The Atma is eternal and beyond space and time. It is neither born nor does it die. Do you understand that, Arjuna? Drona and Bhishma are all the Atma, just like you and I are. So how can they die? It is their bodies that would get destroyed like a dress getting worn out. Why feel miserable about something trivial like that? One day or the other, the old dress has to be thrown away. Your problem is that you are focusing on bodies called Drona, Bhishma, etc. rather than the Atma embedded within those bodies. Your focus is wrong and that really is your problem. You may still be puzzled. You may ask, why complicate matters by bringing in the Atma and all that, which few understand? Why could not Krishna simply say, Arjuna, get up and fight. That is the promise you made earlier and you cannot go back on that now. Why all this elaborate spiritual lecture? Well, do you think God would do anything without a purpose? Baba says that God came as Krishna mainly to teach the Gita. If his job was merely to get Arjuna to change his mind and pick up the bow and arrow, then the Lord could have easily done what we think he should have done. No. The Lord's purpose was very different. His purpose was to teach man how he should act 
and how he should go through life spiritualizing every action does that sound mysterious just listen krishna please pardon me i just do not see the purpose of all this talk about the atma i understand that the atma might be important in spiritual context but here we are talking about war about killing i am telling you that i do not want to kill my grandfather gurus and blood relatives it is as simple as that why are you complicating matters by telling me things i hardly understand that is the problem with man it was so then and it is more so in this internet age but the lord never says anything without a purpose what is that purpose let us find out arjuna are you suggesting that i do not know anything about war and peace or about killing and death let me explain why i am telling you something about the atma you see arjuna life is all about actions there is no moment when we do not act krishna are you seeing that we act even while sleeping of course we do you may be sleeping but does not your heart beat do not your lungs breathe does not the beating of the heart and breathing by lungs constitute action all right there is always some action going on but what has that got to do with the atma ah that is where lies the secret of life krishna this seems to be a day for riddles here we are in the battlefield and i have an important decision to make while you are playing with me posing riddles arjuna you mistake me it is a pity you do not understand how serious i am i am telling you all this out of compassion for you and because you are my dear friend krishna i am sorry i got you wrong i know you always have my best interest in your heart forgive me please and go ahead with what you were saying good you see arjuna there are two things you must know first is that all actions in life must be made spiritual krishna krishna hold on for a minute please you say that all actions must be spiritual can war ever be spiritual hachuna why do you have to be so impatient just hear me out will you sorry lord i told you all actions must be spiritual because it is only spiritual actions that would enable you to fulfill the purpose of life purpose of life what is that maybe we can now begin to understand why lord krishna was drawing arjuna's attention to the purpose of life in the gita krishna does not dwell on it in detail but bhagwan baba has done so in many discourses it might be useful to get a quick glimpse of that first so that we can understand better the dialogue between krishna and arjuna baba says life is not given for enjoyment making merry and all that as many seem to imagine birds and bees have a limited objective they simply have to survive exist breed and then die their life consists of just a few routine items eating sleeping reproducing and dying human life on the other hand has a higher purpose as baba often reminds jantu nam narajanmam durlabham meaning essentially that life in human form is extremely rare and precious why has god given this precious gift of life 
as a human so that we may realize that there is a god who is the basis of creation life is also given to realize that from god we have come and to god we must return in other words human birth has been given to prepare us for the ultimate return journey life consists of actions and what krishna is slowly telling arjuna is that all actions must be tuned to this one goal of life namely to return to god it is in that context that reference to the atma becomes very necessary we would understand all this better later as we go along but for the moment let us return again to krishna and arjuna to find out how their dialogue is progressing arjuna you asked me about the purpose of life let me give it to you in one simple sentence from god you have come and to god you must return krishna i shall accept that though i must confess that i do not really understand what you are saying but even if that is the purpose of life what has the atma got to do with that everything everything how come ah uh, now we are slowly getting somewhere you see arjuna what you call god is the same as the atma are you puzzled god has no form he is formless but krishna what about you i thought you are god and you have a form a very beautiful one i might add and now you are telling me that god is formless oh krishna please have pity on me don't confuse me so much i am already so confused about this war arjuna you must understand i am trying to remove all your confusion one by one what i am teaching you now is supreme knowledge also called atma vidya or the knowledge of the supreme self if you know this you would know everything that is to be known thereafter you would have no doubts about anything including how to act in any given circumstance that is why this teaching of mine is so very important that gives us the clue does it not why the bhagavad gita is so very important krishna chose the battlefield to impart atma vidya to man because in a sense life is a constant battle when we have to confront the forces of evil that try to destabilize our lives and deflect us from our journey towards god today's life is full of such destabilizing forces and that is why the teachings of the lord are so very important to all of us think about it jai sai ram sai ram today we shall commence with a chant of some of the key shlokas from the original gita so that you get the flavor of the dialogue as it was heard by sanjaya and as recorded by sage vyasa shri bhagavan uvacham ashochyanan ashochastvam prajnavadam scha bhashase गदासो न गदासोंश्च नानुषो चंदे पंडिता द ब्लेसेड लॉर्ड सेड दौ मोनेस्ट फॉर देम दौ शुड्स नॉट मोन एंड अटरेस्ट वेन वर्ड्स ऑफ विजडम द वाइज सोरो नाइदर फॉर द लिविंग नो फॉर द डेड नत्वेवाहम जातो नासम नत्वम नेमे जनाधिपा न चैव न भविष्याम सर्वे वयमत परम फॉर नेवर वॉज आई नॉट नो दाव नो दीज किंग्स 
nor will any of us cease to be hereafter dehinosmen yada dehe kaumaram yauvanam jara tadha dehandara prapte dheerastatra namuhyate as the embodied one atman successively experiences in the present body infancy youth and old age even so he does when passing on to another body the wise one is not deluded by all this matra sparshastu kaunteya shetoshna suga dukkhada agama pagino netya tam te dikha swabharata o kaunteya contact of the senses with objects produces sensations of heat and cold of pleasure and pain they come and go and are impermanent endure these o bharata nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha ubhayora vidrishtond the unreal has no existence and the real never ceases to be to the wise these truths are self evident yayenam vete hantaram yaschainam manyate hatam ubhautau na vijanito nayam hante na hanyate he who holds the atman self to be the slayer and he who believes it can be slain are both ignorant it slays not nor is it slain when the body is na jayate mriyate va kadajit nayam bhutva bhavita va na bhuya ajo nityashashvado yam purano na hanyate hanyamane sharire the atman is neither born nor does it die no once having been will it ever cease to be unborn eternal and ancient it is not destroyed when the body is slain veda vinashinam nityam yena majam avyayam kadam sap purusha partha kam ghatayadi handikam he who cognizes the atman as imperishable eternal and changeless whom and how can that man slay or cause to be slain vasam sijirnani yatha vihagya navani grinhati naroparani tatha shariraani vihaya jirnani anyani samyadi navani dehi as a man casts off worn out garments and acquires others that are new even so the indweller casts off worn out bodies and enters others that are new the shloka that you just heard deal primarily with the atma they convey the fact that man should not see himself as the perishable body but as the immortal atma the indweller who resides in the hearts of all and now a shloka that reiterates that death is a mere transition associated with the body which is nothing but a dress worn by the atma jatasya hi dhruvo mrityo dhruvam janma mrutasya cha tasmat apariharye arthe natvam chojitu marhase for certain is the death of the born and certain is the birth of the dead therefore what is inevitable thou shouldst not grieve over 
We hope you found it elevating to hear extracts from the original Gita. We now resume our simplified presentation that makes the inner meaning more easily understandable. Towards the end of the last episode, we heard Krishna explaining to Arjuna that he, the Lord, was specially imparting Atma Vidya to Arjuna so that he could, under all circumstances, act in harmony with the main purpose of life. In other words, Krishna was saying, act keeping in view the Atma, then that action would take you nearer your goal, which is God. Remember, the purpose of life is to return to God. This would be easier if all actions are performed with focus on God. If, on the other hand, you let the mind wander to other things, then the action gets devalued and useless for the purpose of fulfilling the main mission of life. That was the gist of what Krishna was telling Arjuna. Let us tune in again to see how the dialogue proceeds now. Arjuna, when I told you that God is eternal and formless, you replied that you were confused because here I am standing before you with a definite form, very much like that of yours. I understand your problem. Basically, God is formless. But when humanity is in deep trouble, God does descend with a human form to help man. To put it simply, from time to time, God descends as man so that man may rise to the level of God. I know that may sound very mysterious and confusing, but I shall soon explain all that. But for the moment, just try to understand what I am telling you right now. I am telling you that though you have a body, you are not the body, but something eternal that is inside the body. Krishna, are you saying that that something eternal inside is the Atma? Correct. And that this Atma is nothing but God? Absolutely. Krishna, let us be serious. Are you saying that since the Atma is in me, I too am God like you? Indeed, and you have got the point. No, Krishna, I have not got the point. How can I be God? I am Arjuna. Right now a very confused Arjuna I might add. Oh, my dear friend, I know you are confused and that is why I am telling you all this. But Lord, what you are telling me merely adds to my confusion. That was the problem of man then and it is also man's problem today. In fact, the problem has become worse. Man today is very busy. He is so busy he has no time for God, for his family and indeed for himself. That is why he is neglecting his health, eating at odd times and that to junk food, going without exercise, without sleep and so on. For what? For survival? Bhagwan Baba says, birds and animals are also focused on survival, but they do not have the problems man has. Then how come if survival is the name of the game, man's problem is so much more difficult. Baba says life for man today has become difficult because he has made it so. Man today borrows heavily. Why? So that he may have luxuries he can do without. He thinks they are necessities. But would life come to an end if these luxuries are not available? Swami says, Man has a nice bed and an air-conditioned bedroom, but he has no sleep. He has all the wealth, but no happiness. He has money to buy all the food he wants, but cannot eat because of various medical problems and diet restrictions. Where from have all these problems descended? Believe it or not, from the mind of man. The education man receives today 
may help the brain but tells him nothing about his true nature that is why krishna is giving arjuna atma vidya a real knowledge which is knowledge of the absolute self and bhagwan baba is giving us the very same thing if we want to have fewer problems and who does not then it is time we pay serious attention to what the lord taught arjuna then and what he is teaching humanity again in the form of bhagwan sri satya sai baba arjuna i understand your confusion so let me do it all over again slowly and step by step will you promise to listen carefully sure lord especially when you are so kind and compassionate to give me your valuable time good and now listen carefully point number 1 in creation god created man as the end point of living species so that this one species can understand the source of creation but krishna i know where the universe came from it came from you i am aware that god created this universe and everything in it yes arjuna you may know that fact but you seem to forget it when it comes to brass tacks now if you really knew that god created the universe then you should also know that god created you too but i know that in that case how come you do not know the purpose of life if god created you don't you think there was a purpose behind creating you i agree that there was a purpose but why are you saying that i don't know the purpose i am saying that because you do not know how to act in the present circumstance arjuna know this to be true the universe is a stage and life is drama a cosmic drama staged by god and in this drama all are actors krishna am i also an actor of course you are and indeed everything in creation is your problem is that you do not know that you are an actor and that in god's drama you are supposed to speak the proper dialogue instead of acting or speaking the way you wish there you go again confusing me totally arjuna stop being impatient and do not interrupt me every second just listen to me for a while without interruption understand yes lord the point that the lord is making is a very important one namely that life is a cosmic drama that all of us are actors in this divine drama unfortunately we are not aware or conscious of that fact and when we deviate from this divine script the play gets into problems i know all that sounds rather mysterious but do not worry for the lord would make things clear step by step all we have to do is to pay careful attention to what he says maybe we should pick up all that next time jai sai ram